If you have come to the meeting this afternoon anticipating roast witness Lee and the local church, I feel you will be sadly disappointed because the purpose of our study is oriented around a very important biblical principle. It is not the principle of attacking individuals. It is the principle of responding when attacks are made upon Christian theology, whether they are made by cultists or occultists or by mistaken and misled Christians. And I would like to read from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the history of the Christian church, a passage which has, I believe, for us great significance today. Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 26. The Apostle Paul speaks concerning the relationship of the gospel to the lives of those to whom it is committed. He says, I take you to record this day, I am pure from the blood of all. I have not avoided declaring unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from your own selves men shall arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Watch and remember that for a period of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day, with tears. The apostle said that he warned the church three years, day and night, to the point of tears. I submit that whatever drove him to warn the church for three years, the church in all the ages ought to listen to. And I think tonight we had better listen to it in reference to a group which has developed and which headquarters is here in Anaheim and which is led by a gentleman known as Witness Lee. People will say, why mention people by name? Because the scriptures indicate that it's perfectly permissible. The Apostle Paul said, Hymenaeus and Philetus have erred concerning the truth, teaching that the resurrection is past. Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith has done me much harm. May the Lord reward him according to his works. People are named when they are disrupting the church. People are named when they are promulgating doctrines which are not Christian doctrine in the name of Christianity. Now the savage wolves, the cults and the occult, and that which would destroy the essence of the Christian message, must be dealt with as enemies of the gospel. But people who are brothers, but are persisting in doctrinal error, and dividing and troubling the church, which is Christ's body, must be answered. Because silence on the part of the church indicates that you are in agreement with what is going on. You commit the sin of omission. I have no intention of committing that sin today. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give to every man that asks of you a reason for the hope that lies within you with meekness and with respect. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Put everything to the test. Hold on to what is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. And then 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished to every good work. Now, the amount of material which is available on Witness Lee in the local church would take us about three months to thoroughly analyze on a seminary or college level. It is obvious we will not be able to accomplish that today. I am indebted to members of the staff of Christian Research Institute, notably Bob and Gretchen Pazentino, for a fantastic job of research on primary documents. Also to Jack, Dr. Jack Sparks for his psychological insight in a new book which is a must for Christians to read, entitled 
the mind bender. Dr. Sparks is an expert on psychology and on the psychological structure of the cult and of brainwashing. You will receive a tremendous insight from this. I am indebted to many sources and people who put in literally hundreds of hours going over books, manuscripts, and the study of the scripture in order for us to be able to analyze properly today. Witness Lee was an associate of Watchman Nee, who wrote quite a number of books on the Christian, the church, triumphant Christianity, and how a Christian is to respond to the world as a witness for the Lord Jesus. And a great many people have been blessed by Watchman Nee, and the Lord is to be thanked for his ministry. Witness Lee worked with him, and in the 1940s came out of China, ahead of the great communist purges, and was sent by Watchman Nee to carry forth his specific views. Witness Lee today is 72 years of age, resides in Anaheim, and heads an organization which numbers, according to their own figures, approximately 60,000 worldwide, and growing rapidly. Dr. Sparks says it is probably closer to 30,000 than 60,000, but it is multiplying. The individual churches call themselves the church in Anaheim, the church in Huntington Beach, or whatever city they're located in. Now what it really is saying is that the church in Anaheim is the only true church. The church in Huntington Beach is the only true church. And what you begin with, with the local church, is exactly the error committed by the kingdom of the cult. For instance, Herbert Armstrong, writing in the Plain Truth magazine, says, this is the only church preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ on the earth today. Armstrong. Mary Baker Eddy. The revelation given at this time, Christian science, is higher, clearer, and more permanent than that given 18 centuries ago. Joseph Smith. All the religions are wrong. All the creeds are abomination. All the professors are corrupt. Mormonism is the restored gospel. Jehovah's Witnesses. Charles Russell. J.F. Rutherford. We are Jehovah's theocratic organization. We are the prophet of God. Jehovah speaks only to the watchtower. Does it begin to sound familiar? Well, that is precisely what we are up against when we are dealing with Mr. Lee. We are dealing with, this is the church of the recovery. Christianity has suffered great reversal, and it has to be recovered. What is the agency of the recovery? Witness Lee's theology and the local church. So when they are in session in Anaheim, and we are in session here, they are the church of Jesus Christ, and we are not. Well, then who are we? We are told by the local church... <coughs> that we are the daughters of the great whore of Babylon. Right. All the denominations are the daughters of the whore, the harlot that sits upon the water. And that harlot is the Roman Catholic Church. The denominations all came from that. Therefore, we are part of that. What is the one church that is the sole exception to this? Witness Lee and the local church. Quote, Satan has taken another step by creating all the sects, so we were created by the devil. Denominations and divisions in the body of Christ. God is moving in these days to recover. What is the way of his recovery? The recovery of the proper unity. Not until these three things are recovered among us will we have a proper and adequate church life. If you get into anything other than the local church of the city, you get into a division. If you get into the church at that city, you get into the unity. That is an enormous egotism which has been set forth by the cult for centuries and which one finds very difficult to see a Christian man supporting. But Mr. Lee supports it. He teaches it. He evangelizes it. Now there are probably local church people sitting here now and I'm sure that they will have some responses to what I am saying after the cassette is released. There will be answers to Mr. Lee's theology 
published by Christian Research Institute and others within the next 90 days. Because it is important that people learn the truth. The truth is, using the name of Christianity, we have a group that is dividing the body of Jesus Christ. And that division is dangerous. Because Christ has called us into the unity of the body. Notice it is Satan who has taken the step by creating the sect, by creating the denomination. That is not biblical theology. Quote, the church life must be practiced today, and there is no other way but the local churches. So the only way that you can practice church life today is to join Witness Lee's church. Now there are stages of the recovery of the church which he recognizes. The Reformation began it. Then fundamentalism arose. Pentecostalism arose. Evangelism arose. The deeper life movement arose. And then the church arose. What is the church? The local church headed by Witness Lee. Now, a description of Mr. Lee, very apt, is contained in the book Against the Tide. I quote it. Lee is energetic and authoritarian, thriving on large numbers and has a flair for organizing people. It's true. Witness Lee was careful, of course, to disown the concept of organization. But he exhorted everyone in the church to be submissive. Do nothing without first asking, he urged. Since the fall, man does as he pleases. Here there is order. Here there is authority. The church is a place of strict discipline. Again, what is the church? The local church of Witness Lee. You know, we used to shake in horror when the Roman Catholic Church said, we are the one holy Catholic apostolic church. Before the advent of the Catholic charismatic movement and the penetration of the Catholic Church on many levels by the Holy Spirit, there are all too many Protestants doing exactly what Mr. Lee is doing today. Not attempting to bring the body of Christ together so that we may worship the Lord across the face of the earth and glorify Christ, through the Spirit, but setting up an organization which excludes everybody else and says, if you want the life of the church, if you want the power of God, if you want to know how to read the Bible, if you want to know how to pray, if you want to know how to accomplish the goals of the Christian life, we are the only people that can give it to you. I think that sort of outdoes Rome's pronouncement. All they claim is one holy Catholic and apostolic church. What we are getting is an infallible way to accomplish the Christian life. And I am here to tell you, there is no infallible way to accomplish the goals of the Christian life unless you submit personally to the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. You are not going to get it. You are not going to get it by pursuing what Mr. Lee or any other self-styled recovery agent wants to promote. Again, he says, do not try to be neutral, do not try to reconcile them. You know the denominations are wrong, yet you still remain because you are afraid of what others will say. So, down with the denomination. Down with Satan's design. Back to one thing, the local church. We managed to collect quite a few affidavits and statements from people who have undergone the psychological structure of the local church. There are too many of them to quote. But Dr. Sparks and others have already commented on, commented on them, and I must agree with their conclusion. Listen carefully. Quote, My daughter and son-in-law started writing me about how they found the church life and how God had led them to the local church. I thought they might have found a truly Christ-like fellowship until they moved back to Anaheim to be near Brother Lee. When I saw them, I could hardly recognize them. They were almost paranoid in their belief that all the churches were out to get them. They moved in with an older couple in the local church who appeared to be running their lives. They began having marital problems. The older couple separated them, making my son-in-law sleep in the garage while my daughter slept upstairs. She kept telling us they were ruining her life. Yet we see her now only about once a month. One of the first changes often noticed in persons who join the local church is that they quickly assume that all who are not in the Lord's recovery, which is another name for that church, are persecuting them. That is precisely what I found when I began my investigation well over a year ago. I had read some of the material, talked with some of the people, 
And so I decided that the best thing to do was to get information directly from Witness Lee. We sent him two registered letters for which his church signed. They received them. We have the receipts. They were not responded to. Then, I was to speak here in Santa Ana, and the Lutheran church in which I was to speak advertised the local church on a sheet of paper with cultic groups, non-Christian cults. I knew nothing about it. When I arrived, the local church people were there and upset because they were classified with the Jehovah's Witnesses in the Mormons. They told the church, the Lutheran church, in a fine Christian manner that they were going to sue them. Which, of course, doesn't indicate too much of a representation of the love of the body of Christ. The Lutherans made a mistake, and they corrected. However, I felt it was necessary, in view of a tract which we had written at Christian Research Institute, to try and meet with Mr. Lee personally. You have ought against your brother? The scripture says... Go to him. So, I made contact with Witness Lee. I went and had lunch with him. He asked to record our conversation so there wouldn't be any differences of opinion afterwards, and he would give me a copy of the tape so we would both have it. We spoke for some three hours, during which time I assured him that we were not out to, quote, get him or the local church. We were interested in ascertaining the theology, and making sure that there was no misrepresentation or confusion. I left on the pleasantest terms, and I am still waiting for a copy of my tape. When I asked for it the fourth time, Mr. Lee said that because one of the people from Christian Research Institute wrote a letter he didn't like, he wasn't giving me the tape. But I'd hate to tell you how many letters his people write that I don't like. But if I made a promise, I'd keep my word, and he has not kept his. That is as clear as crystal. I have nothing personally against Mr. Lee. But Mr. Lee's theology is dividing Christians and attacking the structure of historic Christianity. And we're going to see how it's done and what the attitude of the Christian church should be in these circumstances. I think it is also very important to understand that when you go into the local church movement. Your first contact is usually from a local church member. They invite you to a fellowship or a Bible study on a Friday night, probably at a member's house. The evening that you're there is punctuated with loud exclamations of, quote, Oh, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. You may think that's rather strange. No, it isn't. That is known as the doctrine of releasing the Spirit. You release the Spirit by shouting these things. Suppose in the meeting of the local church we did not do anything but said, O oh Lord, Amen, Hallelujah, O oh Lord, Amen, Hallelujah, O oh Lord, Amen, Hallelujah. If the Lord were to lead us to do this for two hours, I believe we would all be set on fire and somewhat hoarse. Everyone would be burned. This is much, much better than any kind of prevailing message. Why is this? is because when we say these four words, we are touching the seven spirits of God, which are before the throne. Try it and see if the seven spirits will not burn you. Well, what intrigues me about this statement is that shouting, O oh Lord, Amen, Hallelujah, is much better than any kind of prevailing message. I don't think that this is grounded at all in biblical theology. Because when you get together for praise, part of your praise is the study of the Word of God. And the local church people are oriented experientially. Everything is built around their experience. And even when they get to the Bible, as we shall see, they do not study the Scriptures in the classic biblical sense at all. Now, the group pressure comes down on you when you go there. The newcomer feels as if this first gathering is an impossible thing for him to get into. He's emotionally high. And then, as the person begins to repeat after them what they are saying, the new convert is never left alone. He has no transportation. He's picked up for meetings. A combination of dinners, fellowship, and meetings occupy the convert's time. 
And then you get this kind of teaching. Quote, As long as Jesus is with us, we need no regulation, no ritual, no doctrine or forms. Do you come to the meeting for teaching or for learning? We must come to the meeting for feasting. And notice how subtle this is. When you go to a meeting, you are not going there for teaching or for learning. And certainly not for doctrine. Well, I'd like you to open your Bible to 1 Timothy and see what you're supposed to be doing if you're a person who is in the Spirit and trying to grow in the Christian life. 1 Timothy. How many have your Bible? That's not enough. Them that has, look on with them that don't. 1 Timothy, chapter 4. Verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. Witness Lee says you don't have to read, you don't have to have doctrine, you don't have to have teaching, just go to the meeting and feast. On what? On somebody's experience? Feast on somebody else's testimony? Or feast upon the Word of God? Jesus Christ left us Holy Scripture for the purpose of doing what? Building us up in our most holy faith. It's when we get away from Holy Scripture and into the teachings of men who draw away disciples after themselves and spend their time splitting and dividing the Christian church that the unity of the body of Christ is in danger. Now maybe you aren't as excited about it as I am, but I've traveled this country and I have traveled the world and I have seen division take place in the Christian church on unprecedented scales in the last 30 years. And the one thing we do not need any more of is division. You are taught two principles when you join. Whoever is not in the local church is wrong. And two, thinking or questioning is wrong. That's the best insulation, Dr. Sparks says, from reality. Cut yourself off so that you have no communication. That's why people who get into the local church and come back to their families are almost like strangers many times. Because anybody that disagrees with Witness Lee is wrong. He is venerated as an authority. Yet the man has no theological training to justify it whatsoever. He uses Greek terms in his writings and he can't read the Greek alphabet. And he has working with him men who do know something about it and know enough not to do what they're doing and they still do it. We just answered one of those men in 15 and a half pages on the perversion of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, which we're going to discuss in just a moment. The later stages of involvement in the local church include the new member moving from his home and often from his family to live with brothers or sisters. And then if you get uncomfortable and you don't want to stay in the local church and you want to leave, hear the testimony of what goes on inside. Quote, I was told that if I left God's recovery, the local church, I would be committing the unforgivable sin, such as Hebrews 6.4. Even though I knew they were teaching lies, I was still afraid to leave them because I kept thinking if they were right, I would go to hell because I left them. Close quote. This is very common in cultic theology and psychology. It is the principle of fear. And you instill that fear in a person so that they are frightened to act contrary to you. Now, this is a very important point. Mark it down. The local church does not have individualized Bible study. All study is exactly in harmony with Witness Lee. The interpreter of their doctrine and their teachings is Witness Lee. It is not Holy Scripture and it's not the Holy Spirit. It's Brother Lee who is allegedly anointed by the Holy Spirit to be able to communicate this kind of information. I think when you get to that level, you find yourself... In dangerous terrain. Quote, I was only in the local church for six weeks, but I had every book that Witness Lee had written. I was embarrassed when the Pazentinos told me to study my Bible without Witness Lee's book, because I realized then that I didn't even have a Bible. I knew everything Lee taught in six weeks of non-stop study, but I didn't need a Bible at all. Close quote. It's very reminiscent of Charles Taze Russell, 
writing in the Watchtower magazine of 1910, which he said that if you studied the Bible alone without his writing and interpretation, you would go into darkness within two years. But if you read his writings and never mind the Bible and studied them, then you would be in the truth in two years. What you have, as is common with cultic theology, you have the exclusivism of saying, one leader, one church, one source of authority. The flow of doctrine and the flow of teaching comes from Anaheim throughout the world. It does not come based upon the absolute objective authority of Holy Scripture. One of the other traits that mark this as cultic is that they have, in their so-called Bible studies, recovery versions of the Bible. I was not under the impression that the text had been lost, but according to Witness Lee, it has now been recovered. Different books of the Bible are printed as recovery versions, and they form a basis for their group studies. The recovery version consists of the text of Scripture, sometimes altered or added to by Lee, and extensive commentary on the text by Witness Lee. Then you're introduced to something else. Pray reading. Now, pray reading is an experience you want to listen about carefully. Quote, There is no need for us to, pray, for our, to close our eyes to pray. It is better for us to close our minds. Do not try only to learn the Bible. We must realize that this is a book of life, not a book of knowledge. This book is the divine embodiment of the living spirit, and he is life. Simply pick up the word and pray read a few verses in the morning and in the evening. There's no need for you to exercise your mind in order to squeeze out some utterance. It is unnecessary to think over what you read. It is better for us to close our minds. For example, in pray reading, Galatians 2.20, simply look at the printed page which says, I am crucified with Christ. Then, with your eyes upon the word and praying from deeply within, say, Praise the Lord, I'm crucified with Christ. Hallelujah, crucified with Christ. Amen, I am, oh Lord, I am crucified. Praise the Lord, crucified with Christ. Amen, I am crucified with Christ. Hallelujah, amen, nevertheless. Amen, nevertheless, amen. I live, oh Lord, I live. Hallelujah, amen, yet not I, but Christ. Ad infinitum ad nauseum. There's no need for you to compose any sentence to create a prayer. Just pray, read the Word. That's not reading the Word of God. That's blasphemy in the face of your Creator. Here he's saying to you, you're crucified with Christ and he's communicating through the Holy Spirit and you're punctuating every other word for him. You can't learn when your mouth is in gear and your mind's out. You disengage your mind and see what happens to your mouth. I'm reading it just the way it is. I'm not picking on anybody. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 4 says, Give attendance to reading. Meditate. Think upon these things. In so doing, you save yourself and those that hear you. How important is Holy Scripture? This important. You don't grow without it. This important. The Holy Spirit teaches it to you. This important. It is the means whereby you draw close to Christ, because ignorance of the Word is ignorance of Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ said it this way. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Just don't repeat ejaculations of divine names and hallelujah and amen and all the rest of it and consider this prayer. You want to know how to pray? Listen to the Lord Jesus. Go into your closet, shut the door, and pray in secret. Your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. When you pray, pray after this manner, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When Jesus Christ prayed, he did not go apart from his disciples and say, Hallelujah, Amen, praise the Lord. Jesus went and prayed to God 
Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it be, but not I, as I will, but as thou wilt. At Lazarus' tomb, what did he say? Father, I thank thee that thou hearest my prayers. I know thou hearest me always. But I have said this for those who are standing here. What did he do in his great high priestly prayer? It's recorded in John chapter 17. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's prayer. Not hacked up with somebody's interpretation of how you get to God. Witness Lee's interpretation of how you get to God and the local church's interpretation is not the historic interpretation of the New Testament or of biblical theology. It is an attempt to have something different. Well, this something different is full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, the experience that we have is always subject to Scripture. Because it's subject to Scripture... There are certain doctrinal areas where Witness Lee and the local church deviate from historic Christianity. It would take 20 pages to do justice to it. We have just a few. On the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, Witness Lee and the local church are anti the historic view of Trinitarian theology. This is the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Quote, Within the nature... Of the one God, there are three eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons existing simultaneously, all sharing the divine nature, and all called God. You doubt it? Check your Bible. Second Peter, chapter 1, Peter identifies God the Father. John Chapter 8, verse 58, John identifies Jesus Christ. I am uh, that I am, God in human flesh. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwell among us. And the third person is mentioned in Acts chapter 5. Very clearly, the Holy Spirit is called God by Peter, the same man that called the Father God. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Thou hast not lied to men, thou hast lied to God. There are three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Of course we cannot understand all there is about the Trinity, because if we could understand fully the nature of God, we would be God. But it's obvious that none of us has those qualifications. Therefore the scripture says, God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. He also tells us what the Trinity is not. And that's very important. Because Witness Lee has perverted the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And has adopted an ancient church heresy known as monarchianistic modalism. That's a 50 cent word. But translated, it boils down to this. There are two types of modalism. The logical person who realizes that God cannot be both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time. And then they say, God was first the Father, became the Son, and then became the Holy Spirit. Theological ones recognize that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are spoken of at the same time, and therefore try to say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit somehow exist at the same time, and yet are each other. That's the two classic modes of modalistic theology, which is heretical theology condemned by the Council of Chalcedon in 451 and known in church history as a heretical doctrine, first propounded by Sibelius in the 3rd century, arguing that there is one person who looks like the Father, looks like the Son, and looks like the Holy Spirit. But really, there's only one person, and that's the Father. Witness Lee is unique. It used to be that you had one or the other heresy. He has both of them. He teaches, God was the Father, became the Son, and is now the Holy Spirit. And then he adds one other thing to it. 
The Holy Spirit is in the process of becoming the church so that the church ends up as God. Somebody says, do they really believe that? Yes, they really believe that. It took us hundreds of pages of waiting and documentation to come up with it. Quote, Thus, the three persons of the Trinity become the three successive steps in the process of God's economy. Three successive steps. Step one is the Father, step two is the Son, step three is the Holy Spirit, and the last step is the church. We go further. Quote, In the heavens where a man cannot see, God is the Father. When he is expressed among men, he is the Son. When he comes into men, he is the Spirit. The Father was expressed among men in the Son. The Son became the Spirit to come into men. The Father is in the Son. The Son became the Spirit. The three are just one God. Likewise, the Father, Son, and Spirit are not three gods, but three stages of one God for us to possess and enjoy. One publication by the local church has more than 50 citations of historical reference to the church fathers. Now, I did my doctoral thesis in the first five centuries of the Christian church and on the heresies of the church in the first five centuries. And I am here to tell you that of the 50-odd citations in their pamphlet, 31 are false and out of context. Yet the average person reads that thing, sees a prominent theologian's name on it who never checked it out, and says, well, that's interesting, the local church is right with the church fathers. You bet they are, right in the heresy. And that's the way that theology has been considered, heretical. The United Pentecostal Church has the other side of the heresy. There's only one person, and that's Jesus. He looks like the Father, he looks like the Holy Spirit, but always it's Jesus only. Now what happens to you when you get into this view of the Trinity is that you contradict the Scriptures, and let me show how they contradict the Scriptures. First of all, Jesus prayed to his Father. Am I correct? Father, the hour has come. Glorify thou me. Who is he talking to? Himself? Yes, says Witness Lee. The son who prays is the father who listens. And to that I say, rubbish. Theological rubbish. Because if the father is listening and the son is praying, one of them isn't doing something. The voice comes from heaven when Jesus is baptized. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Good ventriloquist act. Christ prays at the grave of Lazarus. I know you hear me always, Father. That is, I hear myself always. What nonsense. And this is exactly what's being told as the recovery of Christianity. This isn't the recovery of Christianity. This is the preparation for cremation. And it is not Christian theology. Goodness Lee says, The Son is the Father. He is? If the Son is the Father, you got a terrible problem in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was face to face with God. Who was he face to face with? A cosmic mirror? Looking at himself? The Son was face to face with the Father. You cannot destroy the distinction of the Holy Trinity. Because once you do that, you destroy the foundation of the deity of Jesus Christ. This, of course, is absolutely essential to the Christian message. Likewise, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not three gods, but three stages of one God. Again, we know the Lord is the Son, and that He is also called the Father. You know where that comes from. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall rest upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Ah, says Witness Lee, there it is. The Everlasting Father is Jesus. He should take some lessons in Hebrew. And he should take some lessons in what the Jews meant when they wrote titles. It was a title given to him. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
And the Hebrew says, the father or the author of the everlasting, prince of peace. He isn't called father everlastingly. He is called the source or the origin of the everlasting. That's quite different. The average person in the local church accepts what Mr. Lee says and goes right along with his heresy. Now, the scripture is extremely clear. So is Witness Lee. Quote, He, the Father, is the one hidden within, and the Son is the one manifested without. After death and resurrection, He, the Son, became the Spirit breathed into the disciples. So Christ became the Holy Spirit and was breathed into the disciples. How does that measure up to Christian theology? 24th chapter of the book of Acts says, Behold, I send you the promise of the Father. Wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high, after which the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the Son says, Wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, which is what? The coming of the Holy Spirit, not Christ. The second coming of Christ is future. The coming of the Spirit has taken place. Jesus said in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, If I do not go away, He, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. Second person. I will pray the Father. I, first person, will pray the Father. The second. And He will send the Comforter. Third. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all at the same time. Mr. Lee ignores these things. So does the local church. So in Trinitarian theology, they have violated the basic structure of a New Testament. Quote, therefore the Bible clearly reveals to us that the Son is the Father, and the Son is also the Spirit. No, he isn't. The Son is the Son. The Father is the Father. The Spirit is the Spirit. And Mr. Lee can have his ventriloquist act, but that is not Holy Scripture, nor has the church ever held it. Now we could go on, quoting more references. I don't think that is necessary. Mr. Lee's position is refuted by one single verse of Scripture. You want to write it down. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, in answer to the Jews, I, second person of the Trinity, and the Father, first person of the Trinity, we, plural, we are one. St. Augustine pointed this out in the third century and said, we are one means there is more than one person. So there is Christ and the Father that is far deeper than just holding a modalistic view. Now, time, our mortal enemy, is upon us and we should discuss the person <coughs> excuse me, of the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ said, what is the most important question of the age? What do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? Quote, Formerly it was impossible for man to contact the Father. He was exclusively God and his nature was exclusively divine. There was nothing in the Father to bridge the gap between God and man. But now he has become incarnate in human nature. The Father was pleased to combine his own divinity with humanity in the Son. With the incarnation, the dispensation began in which God and man, man and God, were blended into one. The first creation, though brought into being by God himself, is by God himself suffered to pass into death, that it may emerge in resurrection as a creation of dual nature. Did Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, fuse human nature and divine nature? Absolutely not. God did not commingle with man, as Witness Lee suggests. In fact, Dr. Spark quotes Mr. Lee's mingling doctrine in this way. Mingling is much more than mixing together. It is an intrinsic union. So when Christ came into the world, took upon himself the form of man, he mingled God and man. That is not what the incarnation is. Council of Chalcedon spelled it out, and they said, Jesus Christ, uncreated, second person of the Holy Trinity, 
sharing the same nature with the Father, unmingled. Unmingled. Christ was separate. He became, in the incarnation, God and man. But he did not fuse the nature. Nobody knows how he did it. The Philippians chapter 2 tells us, He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave, lived among us as a man, and bore in his own body our sins upon the tree. Jesus Christ, according to Mr. Lee, mingled humanity and deity together. A fusion of nature. The church condemned that in the 4th century. But I think one of the most startling things in the local church's theology is what they think of man. Listen to it. At the very beginning of the scriptures, God is seen creating man as the center of the whole creation for the purpose of expressing himself. In his economy intended that man should express himself as the center of his whole universe. It was God's intention for this neutral, innocent man to take God into himself. Now, where does it say anywhere in the creation account that God intended to do what? Take man into himself or take God into man? Not according to the scriptures. And the scripture says that man created in the image of God had the right to choose, which brought about human sin. Witness, please. Man would then contain God as his life and express God as everything. Created man at the center of the universe would then fulfill the purpose of fully expressing God. The serves me, however, is when he gets to mankind and what we are. He teaches that the flesh is evil. Quote, man's body as originally created by God was something very good, but it has now become the flesh. What was it created to begin with? I was under the impression that when we were created in the Garden of Eden, that we were made in the image of God, spiritually, and that he gave us flesh and bone and blood. Mr. Lee has a different version. Man's body is originally created by God with something very good, but it has now become the flesh. The body was pure since it was created good, but when the body was corrupted by Satan, it became flesh. You know what sin is? The concept of the local church, in essence, it is this. The embodiment of Satan. Quote, Christ is the embodiment of God, but sin is the embodiment of Satan. Sin can be Lord over us, and sin must be the evil one, Satan. Through the fall, Satan came into man as sin, and is ruling, damaging, corrupting, and mastering him. In what part? Satan is in the members of man's body. No, he isn't. And he's certainly not in the body of believers. 1 John chapter 4, you have overcome them, little children. (laughs) Greater is he that is in us, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. Well, who is that he? Satan. So where is Satan? In the world. He's not in our body. Mr. Lee identifies sin and Satan so that you end up with the devil in you. The body simply becomes the residence of sin, which is the embodiment of Satan, witness Lee. Sin is the embodiment of Satan, and death is the issue or effect of Satan. This corrupted, transmuted body is called the body of sin, the body of death, because this body became the very residence of Satan. No, it did not. For the Christian, our body is the temple of who? God, the Holy Spirit. Satan has no part of that whatever. Even the temples of unregenerate men are not possessed by the devil. Only a small minority of them undergo possession. The local church does not believe that original sin is an outright transgression against God, period. Oh, no. Original sin of man was not a matter of ethics or of doing good. It was a matter of choosing to be mingled with God or mingled with Satan. I hope you get this mingling doctrine. It means identification of your nature. So if you are not God's child, your nature is mingled with the devil. And if you are God's child, still because you have a body, you have to deal with Satan in you. That's not Christian theology. Can you see what this does to a person who just received Christ at a Billy Graham meeting or an evangelistic service? Suddenly they're surrounded by a group of people who have all the vocabulary of Christianity but teach doctrines like this. 
The result is confusion. The scripture says it is the responsibility of the shepherd to protect the sheep. You are the sheep of God's pasture. You have to be protected against men who arise amongst us and draw away disciples after themselves. Quote, it was God's intention for this neutral, innocent man to take God into himself, that God and man and man and God would be mingled together as one. So what happened? Sounds very much like Mr. Armstrong's doctrine. That man inevitably becomes what? God. Here you are being mingled or identified with God. Quote, the body is something satanic and devilish because Satan dwells in this body. That is an absolute unmitigated lie. The body is not evil. The body is the temple of the Lord and our spirits use it for evil purposes. But the body, the flesh itself, is not evil. The witness Lee is teaching is a heresy known as Gnosticism, Gnosticism in the history of the early Christian church that put down the body and exalted the spirit. Well, that's fine. But what do you do with the mind in between? The answer of witness Lee? Throw the mind in gear. Neutral. And then, just let the spirit take over. That kind of madness has produced most of the cults of our generation. You test what's supposed to be taking over by Holy Scripture, not by what Mr. Lee, I, or anybody else has to say. Scripture. That is where the case is made or broken. The Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by Satan, and it's very clear that there is a very distinct area of difference between Satan and fallen man. Now, if we are mingled with Satan and the unregenerate are mingled with Satan and our bodies are therefore mingled with him, how do you explain the fact that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, Satan is cast into the lake of fire? But in verse 15, fallen men are cast in after him. If we are mingled together, how then is this done in two separate states? The salvation in the local church? It's not just believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but it's actually the conquest of the devil in you. Lee teaches that just as man fell, he was saved. He fell in that Satan mingled with him, and he was saved in the sense that God mingled himself first in Jesus and then subsequently in each man who became a Christian. Quote, After the fall, Satan was joyful, Boasting, the, boasting that he had succeeded in taking over man. But God, who was still outside of man, seemed to say, I will also become incarnated. If Satan wrought himself into man, then let me enter man and put man upon myself. Close quote. That's interesting. After Satan took over, the Lord said, Now I will take a body and undo it. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain before the world began. God knew all about the incarnation that he would become flesh and he didn't find it out in the Garden of Eden when Satan attempted to overthrow the creation. The Bible says Christ died to reconcile us to himself. The Bible says that his sacrifice is sufficient for all sin. Now finally, it is the doctrine of the church that should be disturbing to Christians when we are dealing with the local church. And... I think it's imperative that Christians recognize that we have a faith that works by love. There are people sitting out there and saying, well, it doesn't sound very loving when you're attacking Witness Lee in the local church. I am not attacking Witness Lee in the local church. I am defending the church against Witness Lee and the local church. We are the ones being attacked, not Mr. Lee. We have tried to reach out with the love of Christ to say, let's talk. Let's try and straighten things out. Let's meet so we can solve it. I submitted to Mr. Lee pages and pages and pages of theological questions which he agreed to answer and which he has not answered, nor has his church. And therefore, it is necessary for us to say, we are part of the body of Christ. We don't think we are the church, but we would like the people who think they are the church 
to come back to the real church of Jesus Christ. And if not, Mr. Lee. As long as you have people who say that they and they alone are the body, as long as you have people who say, quote, this Christ has expanded from one person to thousands and thousands of persons. No, that's not true. Jesus Christ has not expanded into thousands and thousands of persons at all. Jesus Christ is still, still second person of the Holy Trinity. And you and I are his servants and his children by regeneration, through faith and by grace. And we worship him according to the scriptures in spirit and in truth. Now the last great heresy of Mr. Lee. Speaking of the church in Christ, quote, In number we are different, but in nature we are exactly the same. No, we're not. Nobody has the nature of deity at this moment but the Holy Trinity. Nobody will ever be God in eternity but God. Isaiah 43, 10. Learn it. You are my witnesses, that Yahweh, my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know, that you may understand, that you may believe. Before me there was no God form. Neither shall there be after me. I am the Lord. So when Mr. Lee and his church says, <coughs> In number we are different, but in nature we are exactly the same. He is postulating that we participate in God, and we cannot do so. The cross is for that, for that corporate body, that corporate Christ. There is no corporate Christ. There is one Lord Jesus Christ. Not a corporate body of people that add up to Jesus, but Jesus Christ alone. God in human flesh. The blessed hope is not the local church bringing everybody together into the body of Christ. The blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Mr. Lee teaches now that the church becomes God manifest in the flesh. And that's the final heresy. The church is God in the flesh. Quote, the church, the manifestation of God in the flesh. This church is the continuation and the multiplication of God manifest in the flesh. We are then the increase, the enlargement of the manifestation of God in the flesh. God can get bigger. That's a new one. God manifests himself again in the flesh, but in a wider way. In other words, God is mingled with human beings. No, he isn't. Because he can't join his nature to ours, we would be destroyed. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. We're finite. He's infinite. To enter his presence would be to disintegrate on the spot. The only reason we can ever enter in there even in prayer is because Jesus Christ on the cross made peace with God through his own blood. The only way we can come into the presence of God right now with assurance is to claim the blood of Jesus. You're not going to get there because you belong to the local church. You're going to get there if you've been to the cross and you're trusting the God-man. In Mr. Lee's theology, everybody gets mingled with God, so everybody becomes a God-man. He refers to this as a God-man. Well, no, you're not going to be a God-man. There's one God-man, God who became man, the Lord Jesus, and you're not going to get there any other way but by Christ as Savior and you as servant and as his child. The church, the manifestation of God in the flesh. This Christ is expanded from one person to thousands and thousands of persons. The scripture says, I, the Lord thy God, I do not change. Malachi 3, 6. If the Father became the Son, the Son became the Spirit, the Spirit became the Church, God has changed. And therefore we are not dealing with the eternal God, we're dealing with another one. Surely not the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus. On the most positive note I know, I wish to conclude. It is the local church that has said they are the church of God. It is the local church that has attacked Christianity. It is the local church that tries to supplant all churches. 
It is the local church that divides. Our attitude as Christians is not to treat them as enemies, but to admonish them as brothers. Our responsibility as Christians is to reprove them, rebuke them, and exhort them that they may turn from Witness Lee and back again to historic Christianity. Because they are not in it now. And we also have another obligation. Open your Bibles to it. Romans 16, 17. Look at it. Memorize it. Mark those who cause divisions among you and have nothing to do with them. I think that's as clear as you can get. Everybody from the local church is welcome here to praise the Lord. They are welcome here to hear the gospel. But they are not welcome here to divide the body of Christ. And wherever there is division, it is not of the Holy Spirit, it is of the flesh or of the devil. Because Christ has called us into union. There is neither barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free. All are one body in Christ. Christ died for the church to bring us together from every climate and every place on earth that we might share together wherever we are the body, which is the family of God. The church in Anaheim is not the body. The Catholic Church is not the body. But all together who love Jesus Christ and are born by His Spirit are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent us the promise of the Father and it was said of Him that He baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire. He sent us the Spirit. And in the power of the Spirit, we must reach out to the people in the local church. We must love them for Christ's sake. And we must stand against their false doctrine. And we must do so speaking the truth in love. If we approach it this way, if we tell it like it is, and if we care about how they think and where they are, then we must reach out to them in Jesus' name. We don't want to fall into the error they have embraced of sending all the churches into Babylon and destruction. We try and emphasize the ministry of the Spirit to the whole body of Christ everywhere. That is extended in the spirit of Christian love to those who are in the local church that they may stop listening to Witness Lee and start listening to the witness of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God.